Hey everybody, welcome to Free Thought in Florida, a production of the Atheist Community of Polk County. I'm Sarah Ray, I'm one of the directors of the Atheist Community of Polk County. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about atheist activism. Uh, I sort of thought, you know, I don't do New Year's resolutions. I think that's kind of silly. I'm not going to lose any weight. Let's let's be real honest. Um, but as we come to the end of 2019, maybe we look at, you know, here are some things that we can all do uh, or pledge to do more in 2020. And so to help us write that naughty and nice list, I'm joined today by Justin Scott, founder of Eastern Iowa Atheists, uh, American Atheist 2017 Atheist of the Year, and Iowa State Director for American Atheists. Now, some of you may know Justin from his recent political candidate bird dogging, uh, famously asking Liz Warren when she's going to hire a secular outreach director, which we'll talk more about soon, I'm sure. But um, Justin first hit my radar when I was programming a personal podcast that I do where we talk about LGBTQ issues and church-state separation stuff, um, and an angry Christian burns some LGBTQ books uh, live on Facebook, and uh, and Justin, you organized a fundraiser to support the library and other queer organizations locally there. So I've been wanting to talk to you for for a while now. So thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Sarah. Hey, uh, world watching. So, um, so I teased a couple of examples of the things that you've done um, that have sort of gotten attention and, and had a positive impact. Um, and and you make a really good case for what I think I would call. Uh, everyday activism or maybe anybody activism, um, right? That is things that really any of us can go out there and do that don't require necessarily a special privileges or titles or a- access, that sort of thing. Um, so we'll talk about some of that stuff, but um, let's start where we often do with just a little bit about your story, your history with religion and, and how you sort of got to where you are today. Sure. Well, again, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I love what you just said about anybody activism. I'm going to have to remember that. Uh, you can keep the trademark on that. <laughs> so my upbringing, I wish, I always say that I wish I had a more exciting story. Like I, I wasn't in some kind of underground cult. Um, I wasn't a part of some really super aggressive church. Um, I think my upbringing really had a lot to do with my dad's job. He sold life insurance for a uh, Lutheran company. And so... For him, appearance meant everything. Having his kids well-dressed, coming to church, that was super important to him. But I'll tell you, it it really got old very fast. And so kind of like I joked with you before we started recording, my beard is a little bit of uh, kind of an homage against the childhood that I had because I remember when I was confirmed, he yelled at me that I didn't shave well enough. And so I think the bigger and bushier my beard can be, uh, the happier it makes me. <laughs> so anyway, I grew up in a Lutheran church. It was ELCA for any church nerds out there. Uh, it was very watered down. It was very cafeteria style. I remember going to on a church trip to New Orleans. We rode in a Greyhound bus for 24 straight hours. Uh, the trip was amazing. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It was cool to be 14 on Bourbon Street going, <laughs> why are there pictures of naked people all over? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway... Uh, you know, I really don't have that horror story. I kind of just got away from the church. And then when I moved to a different town to go to college, I met, met a beautiful young lady, and she's now my wife. We got married, had kids. And it wasn't until we had kids that my dad started pressuring me about, or pressuring us, about when we were going to get our kids baptized. Hmm. And I just, at that moment, I was kind of like, yeah, religion, that's your thing. And I told him, like, like dude, just back off. That's not my thing. And he wouldn't let off. And so that led me to really wanting to research religion. You know, what does it mean to be a religious parent? Do you have to be a parent uh, that, that goes to church or teaches it to their kids? Uh, and, and ironically, I teach my kids more about religion now as an atheist than I think I ever would uh, when I was in the church. Yep. So, you know, kind of, I guess you could say I just researched my way out of it. It was, it was, it was a fun experience. It was a scary experience. And uh, one reason I'm so honored to do shows like this is because there's going to be some closeted atheist out there or an atheist that's just starting to take their first steps that might watch this and say, holy crap, I connect with what you just said. Yeah. This makes it a little less scary for me. Absolutely. I, um, I, I have a sort of similar origin in that I was raised in a first, first Christian church um, in Illinois and 
we were Sunday Christians. Like we went to church on Sundays and that was it. There was, there was my town of 1400 people, um, had a high school graduating class of 32, no stoplights, eight churches. And there one, one church in town was the Presbyterian church that had a youth group, uh, that everybody went to regardless of which church they went to. Um, so that was an odd, unique thing. Um, and there was a, there was a time when I really thought I was going to go into like the ministry. Um, but when I moved out, my parents quit going to church, which I look back at now and think, huh, well, that's, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So we don't even really talk about it today. I don't know like how, um, if they consider themselves to be, you know, strong believers or, uh, or whatnot. Um, but yeah, it wasn't really like a heavily indoctrinated, uh, evangelical, you know, nothing extreme. My wife, on the other hand, uh, grew up Jehovah's Witness. And so there's pressure from her mother who is still in, uh, you know, to, you know, the truth and we're raising our children and all of that stuff. And so of course she had to go at one point to her mother and say, um, you know, Hey, my husband's not really my husband. My husband's my wife. Um, and so that was a kind of a culture shock. So I've sort of experienced, you know, in my own life, just a, the generic, uh, sort of brand of Christianity. And then, but also uh, adjacent to that is this, that strange cult like JW stuff. It's, it's very cult. I mean, I can see where you, it would feel cultish too. I mean, I can remember growing up, my dad even saying something to the effect of, I know you're a Christian. It's just a matter of what flavor you're going to be, but don't you dare end up like the Catholics. You know, <laughs> it yes. was like, you could be anything, but don't be a Catholic. And I went, now that I'm out of it, I'm just like, yeah. how weird, how weird is that? That'd be like me saying, you can be, you can be a non-religious. I'd prefer you be an atheist, but don't you be one of those skeptics. <laughs> right. Right. It was funny that like, I, I sort of lost my belief when I was in a private one-on-one study with a pastor, we were going through the Bible, you know, uh, book by book, writing down all the truths and promises. And, and the more I read, the less I believed and it, it just, you know, and then of course I quit going. So, uh, so I get those, you know, phone calls. I sure missed you on Sunday. Uh, everything. Okay. If you need anything, boy, you just let us know. And I sure hope to see you on Sunday. You know, yep, yep. and uh, by the way, you'll burn in hell if you don't show up. Yeah, after three of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, three in a row and you're gone. <laughs> uh, so, um, so let's talk a little bit about that sort of um, anybody activism, and you're welcome to use that. Uh, I love that. That that has a nice ring to it. <laughs> so. Let's maybe let's start with um, so last on the last episode we talked to uh, Devin um, up in Tallahassee about uh, some, Shout out Devin. some holiday Woo! displays and and she's way to go right she's absolutely doing such great work up there and and like I told her uh, you know we're we're down here um, a, 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 the long stones throw away and so you know to to have these groups start really getting connected and and knowing who our allies are you know, around the capital is very helpful. Um, so we're very thankful for the work that, that they're all doing. Um, but when we talk about displays, one of the things that tends to come up, um, and, and again, we sort of mentioned this with, uh, invocations too, is why are we trying to, you know, put our display in the capital? Um, and obviously it's a response to a, an overstep in uh, an encroachment on church state separation, right? There's, there's a, a religious display that gets approved every year, year after year after year. Um, and we know that the, the precedent, the legal precedent is if you open the door for one, we have to open the door for all. And, and we've been seeing various cases, even just this year uh, where city councils are going yeah, let's just not do it because if we do it, then the the satanic temple's going to show up, and boy, we don't want that. So Holy there's an, humanity, right? So there's an interesting um, there's I don't know there the different tactics that that the different groups take I think is interesting too, um, but but there's one that you've uh, sort of been involved in, and um, and we'll give 
uh, large credit to the, the the local activist who has decided to step up. And I want you to tell us more about him because his his story is pretty interesting. Um, but this display in Centerville, Iowa, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's kind of fitting. I want to go back really quick. It's fitting that the Centerville issue happened the same holiday season that we were able to get so many displays down in Des Moines. Uh, a couple of years ago, it was brought to my attention that they were doing holiday displays down in Des Moines. When I say they, it turned out to be a Catholic group called the Thomas More Society. And what they were doing was putting up this giant nativity scene uh, that had a really odd-looking baby Jesus that kind of looked like a miniature Donald Trump. <laughs> anyway, uh, with that said, when we got a hold of the state this year to do it, uh, they had told us that they split the, st- the, the calendar of December into two different sections. So they were going to have four displays the first two weeks and then four different displays the, the following. And I thought, you know, how amazing would it be? What a show of solidarity and, and honestly just force to show that the atheist and non-religious community of Iowa was connected enough to get as many different displays down to Des Moines as possible. So the displays go up, we get a little bit of attention, not as much as I would have liked, but we'll take it. And all of a sudden I see this story about how people in Centerville, Iowa, which is about, uh, I think maybe an hour uh, around Des Moines, were upset that the city had decided to move their nativity scene off the courthouse grounds, which interestingly enough is owned by the city, even though the courthouse is on it. So that's where I was just trying to dig for details on what are the logistics of it, what policies does the city have, and in the meantime, I decided to call the newspaper and just say, hey, you know, you might want to just add this to your story, maybe next week after the council meeting you can add this, but if the city decides to bring it back, we will then try to bring our displays down. That ramped this whole thing up. It got you know all new stories made about it, which then the Associated Press jumped on it. Uh, so anyway, that was kind of neat. I was up in arms about do I go down there or not. I'm not from that area. I don't know anybody down there. And all of a sudden, after I made the decision not to go down, I'm watching it on my phone, and out of nowhere, this atheist shows up, and he just you know proudly walks up to the table where the microphone is. He says, yeah, I'm an atheist. What's up? (laughs) I mean, what a metaphorical middle finger to all of the religious zealots in the room. And he basically says, like, listen, I'm a taxpayer here. I pay for this building. I don't want to see baby Jesus when I go up to the courthouse. And my jaw just dropped because, I mean, with my in my role as state director, I like to be somewhat controversial to try to get some attention. But at the same time. When I'm out talking to government, I'm trying to do it in a way that's going to end positively. I don't want to just go up there, you know, ranting and raving. So for this citizen to just go up there when he had no guarantee of support from anybody, he adds the comment about, okay, so let me get this straight. All you churches in town rounded up and, you know, rounded up $10,000 to pay for this thing. We have mental health crisis. We have a drug problem in this area. We have little kids that aren't going to get presents this Christmas, but magically you churches had 10 grand to put towards this display. That was so and amazing. Then, yeah. And then basically so does the whole like mic drop yeah. and walks away. And I just went, okay, that dude is legit. I need to connect with him. And you know, I, I could understand where maybe he would have closed himself off. I mean, you're surrounded by zealots like that. I could see where he'd be very cautious about, Do I respond to messages? Do I take people's phone calls? Mm -hmm. Who do I trust? And thankfully, he trusted me enough that we talked, and I complimented him, and I said, listen, uh, what you did was amazing, and just know you're not alone in this state. You have inspired a ton of people. And he kind of just laughed, and he's like, you know, I'm a new atheist, and I just felt it was something that I had to do. And instantly, I went back to 2015, where I had become, I had realized I was an atheist, and I went, holy crap, it's all coming full circle. Like, you're doing what I did, and I have the same feelings and attitudes that you do, and there's got to be so many people out there that feel the same way. Yeah, that was one of the things that really sort of spoke to me was that, you know, and we <laughs> we preach on this, um, if, you, if you're out there and you're like, ah, you know, there's just, there's nobody in my area, there is, 
Absolutely. Uh, we just got to get you all together, uh, and we're working on it. But um, b- but for him to come out and in in this meeting very publicly on camera and say, "Hey, look, I'm you know I'm an atheist and I live here, and you know I'm not somebody that's coming down from Madison, Wisconsin to right. you know rile everybody up." And in my I, case, coming down from two hours away, right? I would. I would have been seen as the outsider, as the plant, as yep. the troublemaker. Yep. Yeah. So no, I'm I'm actually a citizen here, and this bothers me. Uh, there are other people out there who were watching the news that night, who were watching the city council meeting that went, "Oh wow, I'm not alone." Right. right. It's huge. You know, I, I just want to share. A couple of years ago, I was invited to speak on behalf of the atheist and non-religious community at the Mother Mosque in Cedar Rapids, and I was asked to represent you know, basically everybody else that's not religious. And when I got up there, I just went for it. And I started off by saying, by asking, how many of you here are an atheist or do you know, or how many of you are an atheist or know an atheist? And it was amazing. It was like this flood of hands went up. <laughs> and and in that moment, I said, hey, hold on a second. I turned around and I took a selfie quick. And it's been my profile photo a few times. But I guarantee you, if, you, if there's ever an opportunity for anybody watching this, to start off a public speech with that, you'd be blown away, and you would blow away the audience by asking it, uh, just to see the response. And and people came up. I mean, they couldn't stop coming up to me afterwards, going, "Holy crap! You said the word atheist! Like I never thought I'd hear the word atheist at this event." And on the flip side, I had a lot of religious religious people coming up saying that it was so great to hear your voice. It was so great to hear an atheist be upfront and honest about this. So. I encourage any of you that have an opportunity like that, give it a try. See what happens. That's great. Um, and I think, too, like it ties in with there's something that you said a minute ago that that is a, a touchstone of what we try to do with the atheist community of Polk County. And that is is that that positive atheism. Right. We're not just coming in, you know, trying to cause a scene and take your baby Jesus display away um, it, that it's about equal representation and uh representing the the people whose voices don't get heard um and, and so it's not you know i don't want to borrow a phrase from religion but it's not a malicious thing we're not coming at you with this intent of hatred it's it's out of love of the people that that don't get their voices heard absolutely and feel terrified yeah that by, by coming out what's going to happen to me am i going to lose my job is my family going dis, to disown me uh, yep. and, and especially the youth I think all too often we focus on adult issues, and I think we as atheist leaders need to do a better job of reaching out to atheist youth, bridging the gap between adult groups and student groups, uh, putting student groups in or student group leaders into roles of leadership within yes. our adult group. Yes, um, giving them press time, letting them be the voice, especially uh, non-white men. You know, I yeah. think giving better representation to non-white men is, is very powerful. Yep. That was, that was something when we sat down to create our group um, that, that we definitely wanted to include was for a number of reasons. One, selfishly, we have children and we want them to be able to be involved, right? We don't want them to feel like when they come to our events that it's like, you know, adult church when we were kids, bored out right. of your mind, you know, playing games on a napkin or whatever. Um, but also that one of these days, like, we're all going to get burned out. We're all going to age out of these roles of leadership. And what are we doing to, um, to prepare that next generation to, to take over sooner rather than later? Because uh, we're, we're going to get into some of the, the political conversation here. Um, but the, the more I hear from, I'm 40 years old, the more I hear from young people, the more hopeful I am about the future for the world and the country and all of the things. Give them the microphone, give them the platform, let them run the show. Absolutely. And celebrate them after the fact. Yeah. I mean, honestly, even if they absolutely (laughs) just are terrible at what they just did, that's on you for not showing them how to do it. That's on you for not bringing them in sooner and giving them the tools to go out and, and be an effective public speaker. But it's with those, it's just like having kids. Okay, you messed up. You, you fell off your bike. Let's get back up. Let's ride another block. Let's see if you can do it. Yep. 
So so let's do that then. Let's uh, sort of pivot into the political uh, conversation. Uh, one of the things that you've done that um, that I that I like that that is something that we can sort of template stamp and and pass out to everyone. Right, easy, easy thing for you to go and do. Um, and I really think this sort of re- it came to my attention in the 2016 uh, cycle during the primaries. Um, and that's the idea of showing up at candidate events and saying, hey, I- I'm an atheist. What are you going to do for me? Yeah. Um, now, you've done a lot of that. Talk about that sort of and you had no mentor. There was no like you just went out and did this and said, I'm going to do it and I'm going to make some mistakes. And I'm going to figure it out. Um, and so I, I want to sort of bottle that. And take what we can learn from you, um, and and give it to other folks so that they can go out to these events in their local areas and uh, and have those same conversations. Absolutely, and I always try to start off with saying I'm in a unique situation. I'm in Iowa. I mean, I'm in the heart of political country, so it was partly a perfect storm for me. But if you're not in an, in an area where presidential candidates are creeping through your backyard, <laughs> like we joke, um, there's still there's still a need for you to do this on all levels as well. We need this done at school board meetings. We need this done at city council meetings. We need it done um, with your at, at your town halls for your local state legislators, um, with your governors, all the above. And I think just going out and committing to doing it is half the battle. Just do it. Doesn't matter whether you are good at asking questions. It doesn't matter if you have a great speaking voice. It doesn't matter if you have the perfect question. Uh, Like you mentioned, I just did it. I didn't really have any experience doing it. And I always joke, my first event was at a pizza shop with Rick Santorum, if any of you know who Rick is. Uh, Let's just say he is not (laughs) a number one fan of the atheist community, and he's definitely not one of our heroes. Um, I got to this pizza shop, and I I was scared. I mean, I was like, okay, great. I'm going to pull my phone out. I'm going to ask this question. Um, For any of you that watch Handmaid's Tale, the eyes are watching. You know, I'm going to be thrown into a (laughs) a black van and driven off. But I'll tell you, it wasn't anything like that. Basically, he just kind of looked around the room like desperate for questions like, hey, any of you want to ask me anything? Because they feed off that. They want that interaction. They want to be able to show off to you. And so I was like, "Um, yep, I have a question. And so I was surrounded by people that knew me as the local photographer guy. Like, here's this guy. We've seen him before. And the first thing I said was, hey, I'm an atheist voter. Why should we vote for you? And it, the rush that I got, I mean, it was like fear and excitement all coming in together. And, you know, when I got home, I kind of sat there like, did I just do this? (laughs) (laughs) Um But I'll tell you, it's like it shot me out of a cannon because then it was like, okay, I'm addicted to this. Like, when's the next event? Who's the next candidate? What's the next question that I can ask? And then it became, okay, the first question is just to get them started. How am I going to cut them off? Or what am I going to say to build up a better answer? And, you know, how much time can I dominate at this event? You know, the first answer was one minute. Could I get them to talk for three minutes? Could I get them to talk for 10 minutes? Then it's gotten to, well, can I inspire other people in the room to ask a follow-up question or something that's, you know, of the same nature of questioning? It it was fun. It's still fun. And for any of you that have done it or want to do it, I am all ears. I'll give you my phone number, my email. Hit me up on social media. I cannot wait to meet the next person that goes out and does this in their home state. I will be cheering for you, and I'll probably be helping you while you're there. So. Well, and so I, I want to talk about um, that sort of the the high level presidential stuff, but but you did mention these local races too, um, and I I want to maybe sort of underscore that when I think of school board um, races and city councils or, or county uh, seats, those are those are often much less noticed right people just in general don't pay as close attention to the the small local stuff which is kind of absurd um and and very backwards uh but here in our own county so we were incorporated in march 
And right out of the gate, we had our school board distributing, um, uh, no, sorry, our school board permitting the distribution of Gideon Bibles at graduation practices. Yeah. And oh, at a graduation. Oh, yes. Yeah. At, Boy, so at the practice. Says, Here's something for the future, like a Bible. Right here. <laughs> read this, and uh, that's all you're going to need. Um, yep. yeah. So it was during their, their rehearsals. So they'd walk across the stage, uh, you know, sh- pretend to shake the hands, do the thing, walk down the steps. And there was a strange man. Oh, I'm looking for my Bible prop. I have two of them. I just don't, they're not handy. There was a strange man at the bottom of the stairs. Here's, here's a Bible for you. You know, God bless you. Have a, have a great life kind of thing. And, um, and several, you know, uh, parents reached out to us and were concerned about that. And so that was something that we had to get involved in. Um, and then good for all of you and good for those parents. Yeah. And then of course, prayer at graduation, which is a bit of a stickier thing legally. Um, but we have that going on here too, uh, despite multiple letters from the freedom from religion foundation year after year, uh, that's still going on. And, uh, and then for like city and county level, um, we have the Central Florida Free Thought community has sort of been um, uh, mentors to us as we build in, in our, our own group, and they are very passionate about invocations. Um, and again, not to do them to do them, but to do them because uh, if the forum is there, then we should be equally represented in our government. Um, and so last year they did the first uh, first known to us. Uh, invocation here in Polk County. And then this year in 2020, there will be two, they're going to do one and we're going to do one. Um, and, and so that's one of those things I think, you know, when people are running for these seats and you're thinking, okay, what am I going to, what am I going to ask? How is this going to impact me? What actual, uh, impact does a, you know, a, a county seat have on me and my, my lack of belief? Right. Um, and, and there's one example is that at some point the question is going to come up, do we have invocations at our meetings? And largely the answer is going to be yes, because most of them are going to be Christian and the most of the invocations are going to be Christian. And so, you know, that's, I think, one of those things that you can you can come back in and say, hey, let's take a moment and reflect on the diversity of our community. And, and how do you feel about that? And what are you going to do to make sure that all of these different categories of people um, are included in our city, in our county, in our schools? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. And a lot of times, too, especially in these small rural areas, they don't have any interaction with open atheists. Yep. Uh, and while we say this too, it's not just atheist, but it's LGBT and the intersection of it, um, where you can really open eyes to the fact that we exist, we're out here, and it, we're more than just that. It's not like my only opinions on things are from the atheist perspective. Mm-hmm. But um, speaking of FRF, FFRF, I was watching an interview with Gail Jordan, uh, who ran as an open atheist down. Uh, in her home state, she made a good point. After she ran, now for the rest of the history of that state, no one can ever say we've never had an atheist do this. Right. And so what I found in my own activism is even in moments where we didn't change policy, we didn't get a lot of uh, news headlines, I have been told both in public and in private, just the fact that you brought this up, now we're aware Yep. And now we keep in mind that there's other people out there. I, I don't, I don't want to put her on blast, but my kid's music teacher just came up to me right before the the music presentation or the winter uh, choir event and said, "Listen, I just want you to know that as we were picking the songs, I had you and your family in mind." Wow. And I didn't take it as a yeah, and you ruined it. I took it more <laughs> as like. They really liked it. They really they appreciated it. Like it helped them remember that not every kid in this school goes to church on yeah. Sunday. You know. That's so any, anywho, with the county level, the city level, the school level, even just letting it them know you that you're there, you become kind of a resource point for them. Yep. Um, especially if the district discovers there's a science teacher that is pushing creationism in the classroom or 
if you have a teacher that does more than wearing a cross necklace and reading a Bible, they actually start to talk about Jesus in the classroom. Yep. Well, if every kid in the class goes to church and none of them have parents that are aware that you know a teacher talking about it is a bad thing, you would have never known. The superintendent may have never known. Yeah. And all of a sudden, if you have people talking and parents chatting with one another and you know, how'd Sally or Timmy do in school today? Um, well, hey, uh, now that you asked that, mom and dad, my teacher talked about Jesus yep. and yep. said, "I'm gonna." I had one teach. I had one situation in uh, Western Iowa recently where the parents found out that the science teacher would say, "Okay, here's everything in your textbook, but remember, at the end of the day, it's all about Jesus." Oh, my God. And this was in an advanced science class. Huh. And to think that we have AP classes out there that are being taught by people that are not only wearing their religion on their sleeve, but you know, throwing it out there like that, that's disgusting. You have, kids, you have students out there that are thinking, okay, this grade in this class is going to be the deciding factor of whether I get this scholarship or I go to this amazing college, and i got to put up with this crap. Like, it's mind-boggling to me. Yeah, yeah it's really yeah, frustrating. It's and I think, too, like, when we started our group, um, people sort of found us. It grew fairly quickly, and um, and there were some profiles that just sort of jumped off the page when you know when we started looking at like, oh, this you are a wow. There's a lot of teachers in our public schools who just joined our private Facebook group. Mm -hmm. Wow. And they're doing prayers at graduation, and they're handing out Gideon Bibles, and they're all of these other things that are happening. Um, I bet there are some other things going on that these teachers can uh, can bring to light to us that we can work on their behalf. Many of them feel like they can't come out and say, "Hey, I'm Absolutely. a music teacher, and I'm an atheist." You know, like you know. And I've even thought about not just making geographical Facebook groups but making groups for different professions. Yeah. You know, atheist teachers, atheist police officers, atheist firefighters, um, atheist healthcare workers. I think there's a definite need for a private and safe space for these individuals to come and talk about their issues. Um, here in Iowa, we have an amazing private group that's focused on um, people that support public education. And I've noticed even when I go in and post about atheist or church state issues, there's an onslaught from people that are pro-public education, pro-public teachers that are just so intertwined with their religion that they can't, they can't make the difference. I mean, they can't see why some teachers would be non-religious, number one, and would be upset about religion trying to take over their, their public school area. So it's all about everything. I mean, do we have enough time to... <laughs> <laughs> take on everything. I don't know. <laughs> well, and so that maybe sort of leads into another uh, a topic area that I sort of had on my mind, which is um, when we think of, you know, if we're creating the, the, the list of, you know, what can we do in, in 2020, if we all, uh, you know, agree to make a commitment to do one, two, three things, right? Whatever those are, um, it's a lot about us as organizers helping facilitate, you know, the path of that and, and the resources that you might need to do certain things. Um, but but when we're talking back on the on the political uh, conversation, this is a hot year and um, and there's a lot going on. There's a lot of balls in the air. There's a, so much to stuff just to keep track of. We talk about on uh, on the podcast that, that I do as a personal show, um, we talk a lot about politics. And it's just, my God, there's so much stuff happening right now in D.C. that you just can't keep track of it. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's just mind-boggling how quickly things are moving and, and uh, changing and this gets said and then that gets contradicted and... And if you tried to keep up with all of it, you're going to get overwhelmed. It's going to be too much. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about finding that that bite-sized thing that you can zoom in on and focus on and make that your priority and your passion and finding you know the time to do that in, in our busy lives. So, um, so I guess that's kind of a lot. But if you want to speak to that, um, when, when specifically about in the... 
in the electoral climate that we're in and the, the races that are coming up and, and what we sort of need to do from a uh, from an electorate standpoint of raising the profile of, of secular issues and, and that sort of thing. Believe me, I wake up every morning with this thought. You know, I tell my wife good morning and then it's instantly like, okay, what, <laughs> what am I going to take on? What are the opportunities? Um, so I think there's I oftentimes hear some things like, man, you're such a warrior. How do you do all this? It's like some days I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, some days I just react and that's all I do and that's all I can do. But I think on the individual level, I'm not talking about organizers, but just the individual level, ask yourself, what have I done today to help either raise the visibility of atheists, increase the opportunity of atheists, or help to push back against the assault on atheists. And that's a very atheist specific thing. I, I do love branching it out just a little bit and saying targeted groups. What have I done to help a targeted group today? Because when you look at all these balls in the air that you're talking about, they all fit under the umbrella of church state separation in one way or another. Yep. Even if the issue itself doesn't go up to it, those that are opposing it are usually being influenced by religion and the religious right. I like to say, um, and and I know I I have to be careful um, w when making political commentary, but at personal commentary is uh, whenever someone comes after my community, whenever somebody is attacking uh, my right to exist in a free society, they're either wearing a MAGA hat, a cross, or more often both. And, and even less specific, because 20 years from now, we may not have mega hats. It might be the next It'll thing. be something else, sure. Yeah, So oh, yeah. And, and who knows? Parties change, and, and their priorities change. And so down the road, it could be another party that shows up. But but, but it does have that <laughs> religious connection. Uh, when, you know, when the people that are promoting uh, conversion therapy, it right. comes from a religious place. Uh, the people that you know, want to keep trans people from using restrooms comes from a place of religion, all yep. of that stuff. Yep. Yeah. So one of the things that helps me or that did start to help me when I went out to these events is number one, re remember, you're not going to change the world in one thing. I always imagine a boulder in the road. The boulder can be whatever issue you have, whether it's systemic racism, this huge idea, whether it's attacks on the trans community. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, you're not going to crack that boulder with one one big swing, but also don't get down on yourself if all you managed to do was make a little tiny indent into it. Um, you know, some of these issues, if any of you are Star Wars fans, uh, if you've been watching The Mandalorian, which my family's hooked on, uh, some of these issues are just like Mandalorian's gear. I mean, it, it's hard to get through. So realize you have your limits there's going to be boundaries that you're not going to be able to get past. You're not going to change this all in one day. But did you do enough? Did you put enough effort into what was important to you? And when you're done, can you look back on it and be both applaud it, but also be critical of it in a sense of how do I improve it for the next time? And really start to give yourself metrics of, okay, you know what? Yesterday I went to an event, but I didn't ask a question. So tomorrow I'm going to go to an event and I'm going to ask a question. And then the next day I'm going to go to a, an event and I'm going to ask two questions. Um, I think we put too much pressure on ourselves. I think there's this notion that if you don't go out and get your interaction with a candidate on Fox News, somehow you failed. I think that's so far from the truth. Look at the atheist in Centerville, Iowa. The city had already made up its mind. He didn't influence that decision. But what he did was he spoke to the fact that not everybody in that town is a Christian. Not everybody in that town agrees with religious displays in public, period. There are Christians that get offended by that. Um, so I was happy to hear him bring up his opposition to that. Um, but he also let people know in that town that for the rest of the time the town exists, they always have to realize they're not the only ones there. So maybe your accomplishment when you go out and try this is you just did it. End of story. That was the success. You did it. <laughs> you know, um, I've got four years of just doing it. And it doesn't have to be measured against what I've done. 
you know, make it relative to your situation. Don't try to think that you only went to school board meetings because, quite frankly, I don't even go to school board meetings. So (laughs) you're already doing more than I've done. Very few people do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like in my hometown, when I got them to uh, do a review of everything to make sure that they weren't violating the Establishment Clause, suddenly I was the Antichrist and the whole town (laughs) wanted to come at me. So that's a whole other episode. (laughs) Well, let me m- maybe summarize a little bit um, on the idea of, you know, you're not going to change it all. You're not going to change it all in a day, um, kind of bite-sized uh, portions here. Um, maybe today it's, I went to a rally, or I went to a town hall, and, I, and I, tomorrow I went to a town hall and I stood up and asked a question. And some days it's just going to be, I talked to somebody in the community and they found out I I don't believe, or <clears throat> you know, and and it's maybe you're not throwing the atheist label around, uh, you know, maybe it's it's the the new the neighbor that says you know, hey, you want to come to church on Sunday? Yeah, I'm not really into that. Yep, yep, Exa- and, no, exactly. And that's those little those little pieces all over time add up if we're all doing them, um, and then you'll have one of those days here and there where. You just something gets you just knock it out of the park and you, and you you feel like you've made a big accomplishment, but remember that feeling even in the little things. I guess is my. I think of it as one of my favorite. One of the things that my kids and I love doing is throwing rocks into streams. It's so simple. We just love it. It's so fun. It's so basic. And I can compare it to activism. Just throw the damn rock, because you never know how far the ripples are going to go. And when you, when you chuck that big rock and it splashes, but then it kind of fizzles away versus I threw this little one and it hit five other things, which then, you know, rippled out just because you don't see results right now doesn't mean that it's not impacting something down the road. For sure. You know, throw, throw the rock, get the ripples going. Then you'll have more people throwing rocks, which means then more more areas covering, you know, being covered. Uh, that's a huge opportunity. And just always remember the ripples will touch something eventually. Yep. And, and you'll always remember the person that comes up to you and says, Hey, thank you for speaking up because I thought I was the only one. If you don't mind me sharing oh, a story, I was on a bus please. trip to a political event down in Des Moines a couple years ago. I had just realized in my heart that I was an atheist and I was scared to admit it. I was scared to say it publicly so I get on the bus and I walk past this woman. I'd, I'd kind of seen her at a couple of events. She was probably in her 80s, tiny little white lady. And I noticed that she has a Richard Dawkins red A on her coat. And so I sit right behind her and I'm like, holy crap, this is where I'm sitting. And I lean between the two chairs. If you've ever been on a Greyhound, you know how those chairs are so close. And I kind of just whisper and I'm like, hey, is that, a, is that an atheist button? And I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to keep it as quiet as possible. And all of a sudden she goes, well, yeah, I'm an atheist. Why wouldn't I wear it? And she says it as loud as she can. And in that moment, I was like, if this 85-year-old woman can admit to being an atheist, why the hell can't I? You know, like, that just blew my mind that I, I had such fear of putting that out there. Um, and again, totally random, the, the home phone that never rings, ever, decides <laughs> to ring. <laughs> but, it, but that interaction that you, you're going to carry that with you forever absolutely and for as many people as will come to you uh, if, if you haven't done this yet if you haven't had this experience and when when you do stand up and, and raise your hand and say yep I'm one of those people and somebody will will hear you and and a few of them will come to you and say thank you for for speaking up when I felt I couldn't absolutely but most of them won't. So remember that those people are out there and you'll never hear from them. Yep. But what you did was a huge, this, again, this, uh, this guy in Centerville, a huge act of, cur- of courage to stand yep. up and say, hey, this is who I am and this is what I believe and, and this is the problem that I have with what's happening right now. As I became a parent, one of the memes on Facebook that I really, really love is the one that just simply has like a young parent with a child 
and it says plant a tree now that you may never swing or that you may never enjoy the shade oh, from. Yes. And it's just so beautiful as an activist to think about that, that there may come a day where religion becomes the minority in our country, where being non-religious is the norm and it's weird to even talk about religion. I guess deep down I'm proud to know that I did my part to try to show folks when it wasn't politically correct, when it wasn't the safe thing to do, that, you know, I went out and did the thing. And I, I just hope other people see this and I hope it motivates the hell out of them. And I hope I hope in a year I'm watching the interview with your show where some atheist says, Holy crap, some friend of mine told me to tune into this podcast. Yes. I did and it lit a fire under me. Yes. Well so I have I looked up on my phone when Florida, when your primary is March 17th. So if you're in Florida, you have no excuse now. Yep. You have heard us talk about this. You have plenty of time. I fully, I fully expect that you're going to get on this. And remember, Iowa is February 3rd. And if you decide to wait until February 3rd to start planning this, you're already late. Yep. <clears throat> well, I have a, a whole other page of things that I want to talk to you about. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but to be continued. Yes. Let's, uh, let's put a pin in that. And um, we'll have you back on again and again and again and again. Because uh, there's lots of things that uh, that we can get into. But I appreciate you for uh, taking some time with us today. And, and again, everybody, let's just make that decision today uh, that, that we are going to make an effort to do just a little bit more. Throw the rock. Just throw it. Awesome. Justin, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, Sarah. All right, Justin Scott, founder of Eastern Iowa Atheists and the Iowa State Director for American Atheists. Uh, very great conversation. I'm so glad that uh, I got to spend some time uh, chatting with him. And and let me tell you, there are just so many great people that we're all getting connected and uh, and and making this movement happen. It's just wonderful. Again, uh, I'll echo what I said on the last one. If you're looking for a group reach out. If you are wanting to start a group because there's not one near you, reach out. There's a lot of great resources for you out here and, and we want to help you have a, a safe uh, place to, to get together with like-minded people. So that's going to do it for us uh, today. Again, Free Thought in Florida is a production of the Atheist Community of Polk County, a Florida nonprofit organization. If you want to learn more about us at the ACPC, go to polkatheists.org. Uh, you can go there, make a donation, find out what we're all about, and how you can get involved. Again, that's polkatheists.org. And we'll see you next time. Yeah.